this talk is specifically about um, the trend that we've noticed in um, fake peer reviews. It's something we've been tracking for a few years, like COPE has as well. So, I mean, really what this talk is about is the bigger picture, too, of this, uh, when there is a new trend in how to subvert the science publishing process. How do we go about that? How do we cover it? How do we deal with it? Um, and so we can just focus on the case of uh, fake reviews. What part do we all play in the process, including the media, which is, which is what our role is. I'll talk about how we approached the fake peer review story as a media outlet and what we're trying to learn from it so that when the next trend that we discover, the next way we find people are subverting the peer review process or science publishing that we can sort of tackle it a little bit better. So fake peer review is something many people are doing. Um, these are faces that might be familiar to a couple of us and uh, I think we may hear about the same cases from different people. But um, the few stand out from the rest, but we I'd say about an average of uh, at least once a week we find a retraction that's due to some form of compromised uh, peer review and it involves names of people we've never heard of before. So this is uh, pretty widespread. It's not um, focused on just a few kind of bad actors, if you will. So this is just an overview of the problem. Uh, we've counted a total of 319 total retractions uh, due to fake peer review since 2012. And that's around a tenth of all papers that have been retracted in that time period. So it's a significant cause of retraction. We don't see any publisher that has avoided the problem. You see all the big names up there. Publishers will call it different things if you're looking at retraction notices, trying to find it yourself. These are the words you'll see that tell you that something has been subverted in the peer review process. We see a lot of compromised in that kind of general, for, general term. That's another quote you see sometimes. Systemic and detailed investigation suggests a third party was involved. That's something we're seeing too where uh, there are these companies that they're hard to locate, hard to pin down. We know a little bit about one that I'll get into, but it's where researchers hire them to sort of facilitate getting their manuscript published. And one of the services the third party will do is somehow subvert the peer review process, maybe you know, submit fake reviewers or create e Gmail addresses or, you know, general email addresses for real people and then write the reviews themselves. So you will see third party things mentioned and often when you do it's related to peer, fake peer review. Um, and this is just a point to make that not all fakes are fake. Sometimes um, we, ha we see a real person who is a renowned scientist in their field that suggests as a reviewer, but the author creates a fake email address for that person. And that's often how the journal finds out about it, is the person who's supposed to have reviewed the paper realizes they didn't see it and then contacts the journal. So what we did is um, we saw that there was a trend here, and what we do is we write about what we're seeing, especially when there's a trend, and we're trying to uh, branch out more from just a blog, and we, we write larger stories for other outlets. So in 2014, November, we wrote a big story in Nature that was just about, um, this is actually, I have to confess, before I started, so I wasn't involved in this particular story, but the details, you know, are from very familiar to me. It told the story of um, a couple of the biggest cases that we'd seen that maybe will be familiar to you guys, it was, uh, the first one was Hyung In Moon. And um, it's probably, too, you can't see his picture too well, but it doesn't really matter. Um, he was a plant researcher in South Korea. And what had happened was that so, this one editor at one journal was just really curious about why so many of his reviews had been returned immediately, within 24 hours, which is, you know, kind of unheard of with normal peer review. And when confronted about this, Moon immediately said, oh, I've been doing them myself. So there wasn't really any sleuthing involved. Um, but the fallout was that he, this one publisher had to retract 28 of his papers. And so far, he's uh, lost 35 due to, uh, I think most of them are due to fake reviews. And that editor is 
the editor involved, not the one who figured it out, but someone, the editor of the journal had to resign over everything. Um, we also, in, the, in the, the piece, told the story of Peter Chen. I don't have a photo of him. Uh, but the, the sort of breakdown of the case is that in 2013, an editor just got a little suspicious. That's often what happens. People just sort of think, oh, these reviews are a little too pretty or coming in too quickly or there's a lot of non-institutional email addresses here. So the SAGE was the publisher, did a really big investigation and found in that case there were 60 articles from this one author. And um, they've been citing each other all this time and then at the center of everything was this one engineer named Peter Chen, who was based in Taiwan. And uh, so he lost a lot, both of them have lost a, a lot of papers. Um, his brother is also a researcher and they found out that he, he's, a lot of his papers have been retracted for fake reviews as well. Um, both Peter and his brother Cheng Wu are now on our leaderboard, we have this you know, site on our, a feature on our site that lists the individual people with the most retractions. And it's the top 10, it's always kind of changing. But both of them are on our, oh no, top 20, sorry. Both of them are on our top 20. Peter Chen has, um, out of all individual scientists, the fifth highest number of retractions. He's up to 43. Um, his brother is number 13, he's got uh, 28. So. That's a significant number, especially when the people above, you know, Peter Chen are names that should be kind of infamous in science, like uh, Yoshitaka Fuji, who has almost 200 retractions, and then Joaquin Bolt, who's also, I think, about 100. So our paper, our, our story came out in November 2014, and then COPE came out with a statement about this very issue in December 2014. So it was clear to us that we and COPE had both been working on this and thinking about this and trying to deal with this for together simultaneously, sort of in parallel. Um, and then with all, with this, this attention, luckily, word started to spread. We got, you know, pick up in the Washington Post about it. Um, I have friends who ask what I do and sometimes I mention, oh, I'm giving a talk and they say, oh, what it's about. And I say fake peer review and they know they've heard of it even though they have no science background, they have nothing to do with publishing. It's something that's kind of um, pervading the consciousness of the country, with, which is nice. I mean, it's nice that people are more and more aware of it. So, which is, you know, as more attention grows, the good thing is that then journals pay more attention to it. So this is sort of a question we've been asking ourselves internally and I wanted to just pose here to think about, I don't know if there is any way for the media and COPE to work together to raise awareness of an, a topic like this because we've seen it sort of snowballs that the more editors and journals see people retracting papers for peer review, they start trying to learn from that. They start looking at their past reviews and their, what they've gotten back from authors and there are more retractions for that reason and it just helps clean up the literature. So spreading the word is a good thing in that respect. Um, so, but as, you know, journals and other people have been working together, they've developed warning signs, which I think I've, I've mentioned a few of them, that people now use to flag uh, papers they think have been compromised in the peer review process in some way. The big one is a non-institutional email address for a reviewer that an author suggests the reviewer says, use this Gmail, it's the only one he or she responds to or something like that. Um, and obviously the author has to recommend the person themselves. Uh, the review is returned within a few hours sometimes, 24 hours, that's really suspicious. Even a couple days is suspicious. Um, and this is when we like, normally with the paper, two out of three reviewers like it. And you know, and the third you just kind of deal with. But when all three of them like the paper, that's when you gotta kind of be a little suspicious. Um, other warning signs we've seen is when um, Publishers will rely on computerized systems that allow researchers to directly submit authors and reviewers, and there's not a lot of oversight. It's sort of this automated process. Um, there's no independent verification of the reviewer's identities. That's another time we've seen people get vulnerable. Um, another warning sign we've noticed is if um, an author asks, instead of recommending reviewers, will ask to exclude 
almost every scientist in their field. So then you're kind of, that seems a little strange. Or a reviewer that's been recommended is difficult to find online. You can't find a web page, an institutional site for him or her. That's another uh, big warning sign we've noticed. Um, so the more publicity there is, the more the publishers tend to be doing about it. We've now seen publishers come out with statements saying that we will no longer accept any reviewers suggested by authors. Um, not that many are doing that. It's still a lot of them do accept author suggested reviewers. But more are saying we won't take anyone who has an email address not affiliated with an official institution. And that's, you know, those are good, really good first steps. Um, every once in a while we get a nice uh, glimpse into what happened. Journals tend to be pretty, um, pro you know, not everybody wants to expose every detail of everything that went wrong, which is, is understandable. But uh, recently, just a couple months ago, the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, um, they had retracted a few papers for pa fake peer review, or maybe just one, actually. But um, we covered it at the time, and they told us, you know, we're going to write an editorial that just explains what happened. And they did. So a couple months ago, I, I put the reference up there because I really encourage everybody to look it up. And um, it was, you know, five pages long outlining absolutely everything that happened at the journal. Um, the clues that they found were these uh, glowing reviews from supposedly really high profile researchers from Ivy League institutions. Uh, they were returned in a couple of days after request for a review. Um, the reviews were like riddled with uh, grammar problems kind of thing that you really, you wouldn't expect from someone at that level. Um, and also the authors themselves didn't have any previous publications in their field. So they really laid out all the things that they should have paid more attention to at the outset, which is helpful for everyone else, you know, to see what went wrong for them so now they can be more aware of the process themselves. Um, and then they contacted the authors, and the authors confessed that this was the case of a third party. Um, and that was they had engaged a company to help them uh, get their paper published. And we, whenever we hear that, we, we really try and pin the authors down. What was the name of the company? Can you tell us where they're based? We want to see their website. And often we don't hear anything. But in this case, the authors told them the name of the company. And it was called um, Edit Pub. It was a Chinese company. And they actually have a website. And we went to their website, and it listed the fact that it helps you get your papers reviewed. And it listed a couple of top scientists who you know, help them getting the paper you know, ready to go and polished and all that. And these were the photos of the <laughs> scientists they said they work with. So we've got uh, headshots of Henry Kissinger up there, if you can't see. Uh, there's Martin Scorsese with the glasses, of course. <laughs> So uh, he, can, he can get <laughs> your paper published if you need some help, you can contact Edit Pub. Um, so, and it was, a, it was a great editorial in a lot of ways. They even published the actual fake reviews that, so you can go on and read them and look at them. And it's, it's really illuminating. Um, so I always, when I you know, talk about fake, the problem of fake peer review, I try to present it within a context. And these are the big numbers we like to tell people. Even though we're a blog and we're, we have more retractions than we can possibly cover, there's about 700 per year. And fake peer review is part of that. It's still, we always remind people that the vast majority of reviews are done by honest scientists who are reviewing the paper honestly. And authors are doing everything in good faith. You know, we've got 700 retractions a year, but there's about three, I think our estimate is two to three million papers out every year. So we're, our blog is called Retraction Watch, but we only concern ourselves with 0.03% of all papers. The vast majority of the literature is, is, is fine. Um, but so then that means of that 0.03%, 0.003% of all papers have some kind of compromised peer review process that we've learned about so far. Um, so that is my talk. I'll be um, up for questions if everybody, if anyone has any other questions at the end. Thank you.